Whenever a new foreign player enters NPB, be they a disgraced former MLB pitcher, a fringe minor leaguer, or a veteran looking for a new experience slash paycheck, there's always one thing they have to contend with. Expectations. Given that each NPB club can only roster four foreign players on their major league team, you better shape up or ship out. But if you play for a certain Kansai-based club, there's one guy you will always be compared to, whether you like it or not. A man who is simultaneously one of the best things and one of the worst things to happen to NPB. He's a man who tore up the record books, helped this club end a 38-year title drought, and became the subject of one of the most famous curses in sports history, even if everyone keeps getting the specifics wrong. He's also the man who, through no fault of his own, gave NPB a reputation as a league where minor league jobbers could become superstars, and tainted the legacy of one of the sport's all-time greats. He also became a test case for the moral failings of the hyper-capitalist nature of bubble economy Japan. But he never asked for this, never really had any control over it, all he wanted to do was make a living playing baseball. In doing so, he would become immortalized. His name? Randy William Bass. Born in Lawton, Oklahoma in 1954, Randy Bass always had two loves, horse racing and baseball. He worked as a stable attendant at a local horse racing track from the age of 8, and in high school, he starred as Lawton High School's first baseman and caught the attention of the Minnesota Twins, who took him in the 7th round of the 1972 draft. Only two other players taken in that round ended up playing major pro baseball. The San Francisco Giants took Brian Asselstein, who would become a below replacement level bench bat for the Atlanta Braves, and the Pittsburgh Pirates took Willie Randolph one of the most underappreciated players in MLB history, who ended up being a 65-war player despite only hitting 54 career home runs. Bass destroyed the minor leagues. After hitting 30 homers at single-A Lynchburg, he shot all the way up to triple-A Tacoma at just 21. He continued to mash, putting up an OPS of over 1,000 while being amazing at drawing walks. This got him a call-up with the Twins at just 23 in 1977. This should have been the start of a fruitful career. Despite having a winning record, the Twins had no real shot of winning the AL West that year. They should have given Bass all the time he needed to get acclimated to the big league level. They gave him 9 games. Bass only got 2 hits in 19 at bats as a DH, and that was enough for Gene Mouch. Back down he goes. However, the AL West leading Kansas City Royals purchased his contract, and after a strong season at AAA Omaha, he got called up again. This also should have been a good break. The Royals only gave him two games. And two at-bats. That's it. That's all. Then, the Montreal Expos purchased his contract. As is the theme, he tore it up in AAA Denver, but the Expos only gave him one at-bat at the big league level. Bass was legitimately getting screwed. He proved time and time again that he was major league material, and yet the Twins, Royals, and Expos didn't give him a chance. Well, maybe the Padres would. Bass would be sent over to San Diego as the player to be named later in the deal that sent John D'Aquisto to Montreal. In 19 games with the Padres that year, he showed flashes of the hitter he was about to become. He hit three home runs and posted an OPS over 850 and an OPS plus over 150. He'd finally gotten the shot he deserved, ah, damn it. After 69 games of not-so-nice baseball with the Padres in 1981, he was sent back down. The consensus was that Bass could hit for power, but he got too much under the ball, and what should have been a home run often died on the warning track. After 13 more underwhelming games in San Diego, he was waived and picked up by the Texas Rangers, who tried him out for a few games before sending him back to Denver, as the AAA Denver Bears had switched affiliates. Demoralized and almost done with the grind, Bass got a break. At the 1982 winter meetings in Honolulu, three NPB teams inquired about Bass. Those three were the Yakult Swallows, the Honkyu Braves, and the Honshin Tigers. Twins general manager Jack McKeon contacted Bass's agent Alan Mearsand, and Mearsand and Bass headed out to Hawaii to negotiate. McKeon, who'd previously dealt with the Yakult Swallows, recommended the two parties to each other. However, when the Swallows learned that Bass had a knee issue that limited him to first base, they backed out. The Swallows already had Hall of Famer Katsuo Osugi and power bat Toru Sugiura at the position, so Bass wasn't really needed by them. Which, I mean fair, their faith in Sugiura was rewarded and he'd be the face of the Swallows in the 80s. 
That left the Braves and Tigers. Both wanted Bass. Both also wanted the other guy who'd come out to Hawaii to negotiate, Toronto Blue Jays farmhand Greg Wells. Both Nishinomiya clubs jockeyed for position on each player. The Tigers got Bass, the Braves got Wells. This threw Hanshin for a bit of a loop. Bass's name transliterated into Japanese is Basu, which also means bus. Hanshin, being a transit company, had a bus line. Hanshin's bus and Hanshin's bass would look the same as a headline to an undiscerning citizen, and with the way sports media talked about players, that led to an issue. Hanshin didn't want people to see headlines like Hanshin bus crashes or Hanshin bus explodes and have that spread confusion at best and panic at worst. So his name was lengthened to Basu, which also happens to be Japanese English for bath. This wasn't the first time something like this had happened, as it's also the reason why the Swallows are called the Swallows and not the Express. But unlike an Express, Bass's career started quite slow. In the first half of the 1983 season, Bass couldn't really get going. The Tigers had been favorites to win the CL pennant in 83, but slumped hard early in the season, and the press hawked most of the blame on Bass, probably because of how truly awful his defense was because they put him in the corner outfield. Yeah, he was moved back to first base pretty quickly. The Tigers were also carrying Kim Allen and Steve Stroder at the time. Stroder was the one most highly regarded by the press, though modern metrics suggest that he was just an okay hitter, especially because of how little he walked, he'd still hit five home runs in the early going. The Tigers had to make a faithful decision. Desperate for some pitching help, they'd signed Rich Olsen away from the Brewers AAA affiliate in Vancouver. Since NPB teams were limited to three players in the entire organization at the time, one of Bass, Allen, or Strouder had to go. Tigers management sat down and assessed what they had. The press wanted Bass gone, but the Tigers management knew that Bass had the potential to be great, he just needed to find his stroke. In the end, Strouder's injury-prone nature would see him Wally pipped in favor of Olsen. Bass would reward the Tigers' faith in him. While the Tigers continued their slide, Bass would emerge as the Tigers' best hitter in the second half, finishing with 35 home runs, a 971 OPS, a 146 WRC+, and 3.2 war. He also finished the season on a 25-game hit streak, setting a new club record that would stand until 2001. In 1984, Bass nearly got cut again. Despite improving in nearly every category, OPS, 999 to 971. WRC Plus, 155, up from 146. War, 3.5, up from 3.2. Now, we know the Tigers didn't have those statistics. Hell, the fact they insist on playing Sheldon Noisy probably means they still don't look at those statistics. But let's take a look at some more tangible stats. Batting average, up 38 points to 326. On base percentage, up 40 points to a clean 400. Hits? Despite playing 9 fewer games, he finished with 9 more hits. It was because he had fewer home runs. Let me reiterate that. They wanted to cut the best hitter on the team because he only hit 27 home runs. Gee, I wonder why the Tigers are bad more often than not. This attitude was probably born from the fact that the guy Honkyu had gotten at the 82 winter meetings, Greg Wells, now affectionately known as Boomer, had just put up a triple crown season, becoming just the fourth player in NPB history to do such. And his Hong Q Braves won the PL pennant. Thankfully, Yoshio Yoshida had been promoted to manage the club at season's end, and he shot down this motion real quick. And Tigers fans thank god he did, because in 1985, Bass would go absolutely off. The Tigers started off the season with the famous three back screens, facing Hiromi Makihara, a man who would go on to throw a perfect game about a decade in the future, Bass, Masayuki Kakefu, and Akinobu Okada would hit back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back home runs. This set the tone for the entire season. Bass, Kakefu, Okada, and leadoff hitter Akinobu Mayumi would all collectively hit over 300 with at least 30 homers, 600 slugging percentage, 150 WRC+, and 6 war. Having one guy like that in your lineup is great, Two was overwhelming. Four is unstoppable. While Mayumi could only put up an OBP of 392, which kept his OPS just below 1000, 
and the fact that he was the leadoff hitter meant he only put up 84 RBI, Bass, Kakefu, and Okada all had OPSs over 1,000 and all drove in more than 100 runs. But it was Bass that stood head and shoulders above the rest. 350, 428, 718, 1146 OPS, 54 home runs, 134 RBI, 187 WRC+, and 7.3 WAR. That made Bass just the second foreign player and fifth player in NPB history to win a Triple Crown. Meanwhile, in the Pacific League, Wells was unable to repeat the feat because of the third, Hiromitsu Ochiai, who prevented Bass from winning an all-NPB offensive Triple Crown by putting up a Triple Crown himself. The media had by now done a complete about-face on Ochiai, who initially had been reviled for his headstrong attitude and now painted him as Japan's answer to Bass and they tried to paint the two as bitter rivals. In reality, the two respected each other greatly, and at the 1985 All-Star Game, the two were even photographed discussing their swings at first base. This was partially because, well, outside of Ochi, the Lote Orions weren't particularly good. Meanwhile, the Tigers won their first Central League pennant in 21 years. But there are two other stories surrounding Bass's 1985 season that weren't covering. On October 14, 1985, in a battle with the second place Hiroshima Carp at Hiroshima Municipal Stadium, Bass became the first foreign player in NPB history to hit 50 home runs, as he hit a three run shot in the fifth off of Kazuhisa Kawaguchi. He then added to it in the ninth with a solo shot off Seiji Kobayashi. This all but clinched the pennant for the Tigers, and it looked like Bass might take the record for himself. It was still far from a guaranteed thing, as he would have to hit five home runs in six games, but it was tangible. Two days later at Meiju Jingu Stadium, the Tigers would clinch the pennant with a 5-5 tie with the Yakult Swallows, and Bass would tie Katsuya Nomura for second place on the single season leaderboard with his 52nd off of Daisuke Araki. The next day, Bass took second for himself, hitting his 53rd off Hikaru Takano. After going 2-4 for four on the 18th, Bass and the Tigers would travel to Nagoya for a makeup game with the Chinichi Dragons. There. Bass would hit 54 off of Dragon's ace Tatsuo Komatsu. So now, Bass was two away from the record, with two games left. A home and home with the Yomiuri Giants. Bass had the opportunity to tie Sadaharu O in front of Sadaharu O. This is where the story diverges. Many people still believe that Sadaharu O intentionally walked Randy Bass in every single plate appearance to stop him from claiming that home run record. The truth is a bit more complicated. Before the game, Giants pitcher Keith Comstock and the rest of the pitching staff were brought into a meeting room by Giants pitching coach Suneo Horiuchi. Horiuchi told the group that if they so much as threw a strike to Bass, they'd be fined 200,000 yen, or about a thousand bucks US at the time. Comstock makes no mention of O, nor has he ever mentioned O in any subsequent tellings. Comstock has no reason to omit O if he was indeed involved unlike Warren Cromarty, whom developed a very close friendship with both O and the Giants organization. My theory, and it's only a theory, is that this was the Giants organization's call, not O's. O just went along with it. One of the reasons I think this is because Giants ace Suguru Igawa essentially went screw this and pitched to Bass anyway, something Bass greatly appreciated. Yeah, he did get lifted after five, but Okada and Mayumi had hit home runs off him. The hook was justified. Still, that doesn't stop people from using it as evidence that O had intentionally ordered the walks, especially considering what happened to Tuffy Rhodes and Alex Cabrera 15 years later. This narrative conveniently ignores Yoshiharu Wakana's role in the Rhodes incident, and the fact that everyone was walking Cabrera in 2002 because he was more juiced than a Florida orange, including Rhodes' buffaloes, but whatever. How did Bass feel about the whole thing? Well, from what I could find, disappointment expected disappointment. When the Tigers had last visited Tokyo, Bass and Giants star Warren Cromartie had gone out for dinner together. In conversation, Bass's home run chase naturally came up, and he reportedly said something to the effect of, you know they're never going to let me have it, Crow. The other story is a little bit more lighthearted. When the Tigers tied the Swallows to clinch the 85 CL pennant, Tigers fans went absolutely ballistic. The streets of Osaka and Kobe were filled with revelers partying deep into the night. In Osaka's theater district of Dosenbori, the streets were packed. Then, next to the Dosenbori Canal, 
some enterprising young men had an idea. They started chanting Akinobo Mayumi's cheer song, and when it was over, they found a guy who looked like Akinobo Mayumi and chucked him into the Dotenbori Canal. Then they did it again with number two hitter Sumio Hirota. Then they got to Bass. They couldn't find a big bearded white guy in the crowd, so they had to improvise. A nearby branch of Kentucky Fried Chicken had the perfect solution, a life-size statue of Colonel Sanders. Good enough. After beating the crap out of the manager of the store, they grabbed the statue and carried it on their shoulders all the way back to the canal before chucking it in. And the rest is history. The curse of the colonel was supposedly born. Story for another day. Back to Bass though. Bass would become the fourth American and the second Oklahoman to win MVP of an NPB league, and he would help lead the Honchin Tigers into battle against the PL's big cats, the Cebu Lions. The Lions and Tigers were coming from two very different directions. While the Tigers had been mostly mid throughout the 80s, this was the Lions' third Japan Series appearance in four years, having taken home Japan Series titles in 1982 and 1983. If the Tigers were going to win this thing, it would be on the strength of their offense. The Lions had a solid offensive core as well, but the power wasn't as spread out. Only Hiramichi Ishige and Koji Akiyama hit more than 25 home runs. What the Lions did have was pitching. While the Tigers had two solid pitchers in ace Rich Gale and Yoshihiro Nakata, the Lions had a rotation that was a bona fide six-headed monster. Veteran leaders Osamu Higashio, Naoki Takahashi, and Hirohisa Matsunuma, and young stars Hisanobu Watanabe and Kimiyasu Kudo. Taiwanese sensation Taiyuan Kuo, aka Taigen Kaku, brought up the end of the rotation. The Tigers' best arm overall, on the other hand, was their closer. Kiyooki Nakanishi. That's not great. That rotation is what had taken the Lions as far as they had, and the Tigers would need all the help they could get on offense. And they would get it, thanks to an odd quirk of NPB's DH rule. From 1974, when the PL formally adopted the DH, until 1990, when using a DH in the PL park became mandatory, the rule stated that both teams had to agree to use the DH in any given game. Up until this point, Central League teams had just refused to use the DH. Did that work out for them? Eh, kinda. In the 11 Japan Series Finals that had been played in the DH era, the PL team had won in 1974, 1975, 1976, 1977, 1982, and 1983. So, um, no. But after reading the rules, Hanshin wasn't going to look a gift horse in the mouth they agreed to use a DH in every game of the Japan Series. This was just the Tigers' third Japan Series appearance, with the previous two coming in 1962 and 1964. They hadn't won a title of any kind since they took home the JPBL title in 1947. They weren't taking any chances. Game 1 would see the Tigers send out Shikafusa Ikeda, while the Lions countered with Hirohisa Matsunuma. Despite neither starter being great on paper and the added threat of the DH, both pitched fantastic games. Through seven innings, Ikeda had only given up two hits, and while Matsunuma had been shakier, goose eggs remained on the scoreboard. In the top of the eighth, Akinobo Mayumi hit a second double of the game. Next up, Sumio Hirota, who the Tigers had acquired the previous year from the Lote Orions, would single Mayumi over to third. Then it was Bass, the CL batting champion who was over three on the night thus far, having hit two fly balls to center. But this time, he'd get all of it. 3-0 Tiger. Ikeda would finish the game for a complete game shutout, and the Tigers would take game 1 3-0. Game 2 would see Tigers ace Rich Gale face off against the 40-year-old Naoki Takahashi. The Lions managed to jump first, with Hiramichi Ishige hitting a solo shot in the bottom of the third. In the top of the fourth, Akinobo Mayumi reached an error from Lions superstar third baseman Koji Akiyama, and up came Bass. For the second time in as many games, he answered the call as his come-from-behind two-run shot gave the Tigers the lead, and it was a lead they would not relinquish. Nakanishi closed the door, and the Tigers took Game 2, 2-1. With the series shifting back to Kansai for Game 3, the Lions came out swinging on Yoshihiro Nakata. Koji Akiyama would get on base, then score on an RBI triple from Takanori Okamura, <laughs> who then scored in a single from Hatsuhiko Suji,
who was in turn driven in by a Hiramichi Ishige 2 run shot. Bass, for his part, tried to fight back. With Terafumi Kitamura and Sumio Hirota on base, he launched a three run shot that sent Koshen into raptures. But it wasn't enough. Okamura would lead off the top of the next frame with a home run, and the Lions would tack on one more after that. Munehiro Shimada would give Tigers fans hope with a pinch hit solo shot, but it was all for naught. Lions win 6 4. The Lions would chuck Hirohisa Matsunuma back out there for game four, while the Tigers countered with Fumitake Ito. Outside of Akinobo Mayumi, the Tigers would be completely shut down. The Lions won 4 2. Bass would go 0 for 3 with a walk. With the series now tied, the Lions sent out 22 year old swingman Kazuyuki Ono to try and give them the series lead, while game one winner Chikafusa Ikeda was back up. Why Ono? The only person who could tell you is Lions manager Tatsuro Hiraoka. His gamble would backfire. Badly. The Tigers jumped all over Ono. Mayumi singled, Hirota bunted him over to second, Bass walked, and into the batter's box stepped Masayuki Kakefu. While this video is dedicated to Bass, Masayuki Kakefu is an amazing player in his own right. He went toe to toe with Koji Yamamoto as the best player in MPB at the turn of the 80s and was the fourth man to carry the nickname Mr. Tigers. Kakefu would unload on Ono for a three run shot that gave the Tigers the lead. With the Tigers up 4 2, Bass would get on with a leadoff single in the 6th, but a Kakefu strikeout and an Okada flyout made it look like veteran reliever Shigekazu Mori would get out of it. Nope. Veteran outfielder Keiji Nagasaki, who'd been sneakily carrying an 849 OPS in 85, hit one over the fence to make it 6-2. An Okada RBI double would make it 7-2 and the Tigers were now one win away from their first Japan series ever. Once again, it'd be Gale versus Takahashi. And I have to ask, why? Why not Watanabe, Kuo, or Kudo? I just don't get it. Naoki Takahashi would quickly get two out, and then Bass drew a walk. Then Kakefu singled. Then Okada got him with an infield single. Then Keiji Nagasaki hit a grand slam. A leadoff homer from Ishige made it look like the Lions still had some fight left in them, but Gale held firm. Bass would add a walk and a single, and manager Yoshio Yoshida would refuse to remove him for a pinch runner. He wanted Bass to be on the field when they finally won this thing. After a two-run shot from Kakefu made it 9-3, Gale went back out there to finish what he'd started. They'd done it. They'd finally done it. Now came for the question of Japan Series MVP. Akinobo Mayumi had been excellent all series. Keishi Nagasaki's late outburst had won them game 5 and 6. Rich Gale pitched two complete games in games 2 and 6. But it would be Bass, who essentially won games 1 and 2 single-handedly, that would get the award. While the more famous photo shows a stoic Bass with a trophy in the prize car, I think this photo, with him smiling ear to ear, is one of the best photos in Hanshin Tigers history. For the first time ever, the Tigers would have to defend a Japan Series championship. No easy task. The Carp and Giants were both still contenders, and if they got through them, they'd probably have to deal with the Lions again, who'd be looking for revenge. In spring training, Tigers fans got the shock of their life. Following the Japan series, Gillette Japan had paid Randy Bass the equivalent of about $500,000 to shave off his trademark beard for a marketing campaign. Even though his beard had fully regrown by then, his clean-shaven face was plastered everywhere around Japan. The campaign worked as Gillette saw a massive boost in sales. As for baseball, well, the Tigers went out there and completely crapped the bed. Going in even 60, 60 and 10 and finishing in third place. None of this was Bass's fault however, as he went on to have one of the greatest offensive seasons in NPB history. 389, 481, 777 a 1258 OPS, 176 hits, 47 home runs, 109 RBI, 9.6 war, and 239 WRC+. 
Not only did Randy Bass win a Triple Crown in back-to-back -back years, but he had just put up the fourth best season in NPB history. The men ahead of him, Sadaharu O, oh, Sadaharu O, oh, Sadaharu O, oh, and Sadaharu O. Oh. Speaking of Sadaharu O, oh, Bass also tied his record for consecutive games with a home run, and he did it against the Giants. He let that one marinate just a little bit. Unlike 1985, when fellow Triple Crown winner Hiromitsu Ochii had carried a higher WRC+, Bass was alone on top. But that's not to say Ochii was bad either. He'd also picked up his second straight Triple Crown and a 216 WRC+, good for either the 18th or 20th best hitting season in NPB history, depending on whether or not you count the split season JPBL era. It was such a dominant season that despite the Tigers finishing third, Voters nearly bucked tradition and gave him CL MVP, something that had only happened twice in the Central League before. However, Hiroshima Carp ace Manabu Kitabapu had dragged his team to the pennant with a legendarily dominant second half, and he would take home CL MVP. It wasn't a huge deal though. Bass would just have to come back next season and build off this. I mean, it's not like any other CL hitter could challenge him. It's not like Ochii was coming over to the Green Banner or anything. Well, I say that, following the 1986 season, Hiromitsu Ochii did something unprecedented. He exercised his free agent rights. Tired of playing in the cavern that was Kawasaki Stadium, Ochii was now on the open market. It was such a huge story that they had to bring Ochii into the booth for the 1986 Japan series so the announcers would actually focus on the game in front of them rather than speculating about whether Ochii would go. Now, imagine if you will, what would happen if the Tigers had went out and got him? It wasn't too far-fetched a thought. In the 1985-86 offseason, they had went out and got Junichi Kashiwabara to improve their offensive attack, and he'd put up a career year. But wait, isn't Ochii a first baseman? How would that work with Bass? Well, Kashiwabara had also been a first baseman with the Fighters, and he'd moved to the corner outfield. Plus, Ochii could also play third base, and that was the crux of most of the Tigers' issues. Probably the largest factor in the Tigers' failure to run it back, outside of the pitching, was the fact that Masayuki Kakefu had gotten his wrist broken by an inside pitch and missed half the season because of it. He'd also broken his thumb. While Kakefu was back, he was also dealing with massive back pain, and that was going to limit his play. But signing Ochii was a pipe dream. The Tigers had a new regime in charge of the team, and they had one job save money. Such a mantra doesn't typically lead to a good product on the field, unless you're the Tampa Bay Rays. OGI would sign with the Dragons instead, giving us this legendary Mizuno commercial. The results on the field were not as pretty. While both players played excellently and finished 1-2 in the CLWRC Plus leaderboard, Hawks DH Hiramitsu Karata had a resurgence at 39 and ended up being the best pure hitter in NPB that year. Meanwhile, Boomer Wells and fighter star Tony Brewer had also passed Bass as the best foreign hitters in the league. There's also the fact that Ochi's Dragons were going one way, and Bass's Tigers the other. While the Dragons were edged out by the Giants for the CL pennant, the Hanshin Tigers finished the 1987 season in last place. Was this Bass's fault? Nope, it was everyone around him. While Akinobo Mayumi was still a decent option, Akinobo Okada had fallen off a cliff. And Kakefu? Yikes. On the pitching side, while Matt Koff was okay in his first season in the black and gold, and Mike Nakata had his first semi-decent campaign, the Tigers pitching was mid at best, and awful at worst. Now, did management feel the need to sign or trade for some talent to bolster this? 
I mean, you can't just tank. The NPV draft structure doesn't allow that. Well, see, the thing is, that costs money. I think you see where this is going. It didn't help that the Tigers kept getting sucked in by big names in the draft and constantly lost their rights in the lotteries, and literally none of their picks had panned out. The Hanjin Tigers were a wasteland. Randy Bass, Akinobu Mayumi, and a bunch of Flotsam and Jetsam. How could this get worse? Well, brace yourselves. After finishing last place, Yoshio Yoshida was fired. While he and Bass hadn't always seen eye to eye, Bass knew the team's sudden drop off wasn't entirely Yoshida's fault. The man brought in to replace him was Minoru Murayama. Minoru Murayama is a Hanshin Tigers legend, one of the best pitchers in NPB history, and holds a slew of team records. In fact, he's the second man to carry the name Mr. Tigers. He also had the managerial chops of a caveman. Murayama was a huge believer in Wa, or fighting spirit, whatever you want to call it. Murayama thought he could coast off this reputation and not have to worry about what his players thought of him. He was wrong. Bass and Murayama feuded from pretty much day one, and it didn't help that Bass had the backing of several other players who also felt the strategy was misplaced. Then, Bass got blindsided. His son was diagnosed with a brain tumor. But luckily, Bass had it written into his contract that all of his medical expenses and those of his family would be comped by the team, so he was able to get the best doctors available in order to get his son the surgery he needed. Said surgery was going to cost $40,000. Remember how I said the Tigers were trying to focus on saving money? Yeah, now we're seeing the problem. The man in charge of the Hanshin Tigers at the time was Shingo Furia, a 56-year-old company man Furia was originally in the department of Hanshin Electric Railway that just so happened to oversee Hanshin Koshin Stadium, which eventually led to him being promoted to deputy managing director in 1983. In 1986, he had taken over as managing director, and under him, everything was falling apart. He was not a baseball man, he was a businessman, and he really had no idea how to remedy the situation. And now Bass wanted 40 grand? 22 games into the 1988 season, Bass visited the Tigers and asked to be given a leave of absence so he could go home and be with his son through the procedure. Unbeknownst to the people he was talking to, Randy was wearing a wire. He knew how bad things were, and he was not about to get screwed. On June 27th, about a month after he'd left for the States, he was cut for insubordination. Bass immediately produced his receipts. The fallout was predictable. Tigers fans were disgusted when the details of why Bass had been cut were revealed. Randy wasn't just some foreigner they could toss to the side when they felt like it. He was the third longest tendered foreign player in franchise history after Gene Bach and Willie Kirkland. He had transcended the role of helper and was ingrained into the Tigers' identity. And this was how they treated him? His son was in a life or death situation and they cut him to save a buck. It was downright despicable and it laid bare all the issues with the economic attitudes that had built bubble economy Japan in the first place. People weren't people, they were cogs in the machine. It didn't matter how famous you were, you were replaceable. If this is how they treated a man who is legitimately a cultural icon, how do you think your average salary man was getting treated? How much of a hand Furia had in this, we'll never know. But he was chucked out to face the media, for whom he had no answers. After trying and failing to get Randy to drop his wrongful termination suit, he broke. On July 19th, 1988, Shingo Furia would step onto his hotel's balcony and step off, taking his own life. Bass and the Tigers would eventually settle out of court. Bass was now a free agent, and there was no shortage of suitors. The Akot Swallows offered him a very lucrative deal to come to Shinjuku. Hiramitsu Ochiai lobbied Dragon's management to go out and get him, and the Nankai Hawks wanted Bass as their final goodbye to Osaka before the team packed its bags for Fukuoka, with team owners Daiei wanting a superstar to make a splash in baseball's return to Kyushu. There was one issue, that foreign player limit. The Swallows had Doug DeCensis and Bob Gibson on the Major League squad, and even though they had an open spot thanks to the departure of Terry Harper, one of those two would have to be demoted. 
The Dragons had Gary Roshik and Yuan Shi Kuo in the majors. They had just traded Ralph Bryant to the Kintetsu Buffaloes, but signing Bass would probably mean demoting Roshik, as the movement to get Taiwanese players like Kuo to be treated as domestic players had gotten shot down. And finally, the Hawks had Tony Bernazard and George Wright, one of whom, probably Wright, would have to be demoted. Bass didn't want to do that to anyone, so he politely turned all the offers down, returning to his cattle ranch in Oklahoma, where he quietly retired. After a few years, Bass was invited back to Japan to play in the Suntory Dream Match, an old-timers game for NPB legends. As the story goes, NPB hit king Isao Harimoto was told he'd be batting third instead of fourth. Harry, being Harry, was incensed and demanded to know who got the cleanup spot over him. It's Bass. Oh, well, I guess that can't be helped. After a brief spell as a scout for the Yamahiri Giants of all teams, Bass decided to get into politics, first serving on Lawton City Council from 2001 to 2005, then running as a Democrat for Oklahoma's 32nd district, where he held the seat from 2005 to 2019, including serving as House Minority Leader, before retiring from politics. One amusing story from his political career was that one time an unnamed Republican state senator was complaining that Japanese firms weren't buying Oklahoma beef. Bass replied curtly, I lived there. They don't want it. Bass and the Tigers have since made amends, and Bass visits Japan every so often. And when he does, Tigers fans go wild. Every subsequent generation of Tigers fan remains fascinated by his exploits and the team around him. And that's just what it was. A team. Bass couldn't go it alone. 1985 was a joint venture from everyone involved. In 2013, with the help of a juiced ball, Tokyo Yakult Swallows star Vladimir Ballantin would finally take down Sadaharu O's single season home run record. He was over the moon. Hell, visiting Tigers fans were over the moon. The roar from Jingu could be heard all throughout Shinjuku that night. It was a roar of vindication, plain and simple. That seems to rub off on Ballantine, as when Munetaka Murakami went on his tear in 2022, Ballantine was cheering him on the whole way. I mean, it helps that they were once teammates, but still. In 2023, Randy got the honor he deserved. He was inducted into the Japanese Baseball Hall of Fame. That year, he threw out the ceremonial first pitch for the Tigers home opener at the Osaka Dome and appeared at Game 1 of the 2023 All-Star Series in the Nagoya Dome, both times to rapturous applause. While he's already been immortalized in baseball lore even before his Hall of Fame induction, I'd say go one step further. The Tigers should retire 44. No one has ever lived up to it since, and asking new foreign players to do so is a recipe for disaster. Hell, I already made a whole video about that, so put it up in the rafters where it belongs and stop the chase to find the next bass. You're never gonna find him. It's a microcosm of what is, in the end, a pretty damaging stereotype for NPB. The success of a guy like Bass gave the impression that any AAA player could go over there and be a star. Well, in reality, 9 out of 10 guys who start in NPB would have been solid MLB players. It's just that teams with primitive analytics departments, or no analytics departments at all, let them walk. Leo Gomez, Bobby Rose, Troy Neal, Ralph Bryant, Vladimir Ballantin, all of whom could have been everyday MLBers if they had been given the chance. They just weren't given the chance. The worst reaction in recent years was the reaction to Aristides Aquino signing with the Chunichi Dragons in 2023. People thought he was going to smash the Dragons team home run record in year one. In reality, that's not to say that's Bass's fault though. He's the exception, the outlier, the man who defied the odds to get where he got. Randy Bass's career is one for the ages, from a minor league journeyman who is constantly getting disrespected by the organizations he played for, to a legend and an immortal figure in baseball history. As long as the Hunch and Tigers are talked about, Randy Bass will be talked about. It's as simple as that. As always, big thanks to my patrons, Juan Jose Sanchez Bracamontes, Alex Irish, The Frilled Shark, Julian Willie, Ryan Fox, Lucas Boria, 
G, Mentasmic, Joe Hiranaka, Bear Kaufman, Lord Claret, Tom Musa, The Baseball Brit, The Japanese Baseball Discord, Tyler Fallon, Eric Cooper, and of course, Anthony Pang. Sorry for taking so long to make this video, Anthony. I'm gonna take a bit of a break uh, from long form content. I'll be putting out shorts every now and again uh, until probably after the Japan series. I have a huge project that was originally supposed to be out now, but this got moved forward because, uh, like I always do, I've bit off more than I can chew. So uh, that should be about a six hour long project and I'll probably tackle it the same way I tackled uh, my team history videos. Except this time I'm going to make them all first and then release them procedurally instead of making them as I go, which uh, did not go to schedule and was not very good for my mental health. So if you're new here and you're still here, thank you for watching. Like, comment, subscribe, feed the algorithm, share it with people who you think might be interested. And with that being said, uh, I've been Gaijin Baseball. Peace.